I don't know, this uh, this AI thing is freaking me out. Look, we're going to dissect everything, and if you've seen the thumbnail, you know this is going to be a good one. Hey everyone, my name is Junaid, and I'm a graduate data analyst working for a financial services firm in central London, and in today's video, I'm going to give you five reasons you shouldn't become a data analyst in 2023. We're going to get right into it, but I don't want you to think that I'm being discouraging to any potential analysts. In fact, I made a video outlining five reasons you should become a data analyst in 2023, so check out that video if you want to see some reasons you should consider a role in this industry. Jumping right in, reason number one, AI might take over your job. Look, there's no doubting the fact that the recent emergence of AI has put so many people at risk of being replaced. With the recent introduction of ChatGPT Code Interpreter, I've been absolutely inundated with questions asking me how I use it, asking me if it can replace data analysts, and I found that people are being turned away or discouraged from becoming analysts, not just data analysts, financial risk, any type of analyst. Now look, I'm not going to be naive and say that there's no way AI can replace what I do. People have made similar predictions about emerging and new technologies in the past and they haven't ended well. Currently, any AI available commercially or privately is absolutely miles away from being able to do what I do from A to Z. Let me give you a scenario. If AI makes a mistake and a business or company make a major financial decision based on the data that's been provided by an AI program, who do they turn to in that situation? Are they going to log a ticket with OpenAI or Google? I don't think that's how it's going to work. There aren't any regulations that stipulate the process that someone has to take if AI makes a mistake, which it does on a regular basis, or if it starts to affect the economy in adverse ways. Also, ChatGPT, Code Interpreter, and other AI tools just aren't reliable enough at the moment. They make mistakes that you'd expect a human analyst to pick up on in an instant for now. There was a really interesting article I read on LinkedIn that said that there were essentially two types of analysts, a 1.0 analyst and a 2.0 analyst. 1.0 analysts are the ones who create a dashboard or spreadsheet and leave it at that. The 2.0 analysts are the ones whose job requires them to go a step ahead. The ones who are giving presentations to clients, the ones who are staying on top of industry developments, the ones who are focusing on achieving business outcomes and not just the processing of data, but are actively involved in providing actionable insights that affect a business or company's direction or strategy. That's something to bear in mind. Ideally, you don't want to be applying for roles that are passive, that look easy to do, or don't require that extra step. You want to work in a company that's not only using AI and growing alongside it, but also encouraging their analysts to take up extra training and making sure you don't fall behind. And that's the best way to future-proof yourself. That's all I'm going to say against AI. We'll dive in deeper into AI and how it's going to affect the workplace in another video. I've actually been tasked with staying on top of any AI regulations or developments within my team. And I've been attending events and speaking to people like Gary Marcus about how AI will affect the workplace overall. But that's all for another video. In this video, my intention is to make sure you take into consideration the fact that AI is increasingly becoming more prevalent. It's going to change the dynamics of the workplace and that's something to bear in mind. When the new generation of CEOs and C-suite executives who have been using AI and AI tools their entire lives, when they become CEOs and CFOs and get into positions of power, then AI will be far more widespread than it already is. And it's entirely possible that a vastly advanced AI tool or program is able to completely replace what I do. But before that happens, 70 or 80% of the workforce will already have been replaced. Look, regardless of whether AI replaces everyone or becomes a tool that we'll have to constantly evolve and adapt alongside, what we do know is that the landscape for work is going to substantially change. It's possible qualifications people are working really hard to get right now become very quickly obsolete and they will either have to upskill themselves or risk being left behind. And that leads into reason number two, which is that there's constant learning. This isn't a job where you just get a degree or qualification and your learning is complete. There are so many things you have to stay on top of. Changes within the finance and tech industries. There's always changes and updates happening in data architecture and cloud computing. There's new tools like the ones we just mentioned and you have to stay on top of these things otherwise you will get left behind. These industries are really unforgiving and you have to stay at the front of the game in order to maintain longevity of your career. During my morning commute into the office I'll read the Financial Times. I'll research market news into companies I'm currently doing work for. I'll be reading any RNS announcements that are of interest. And that's all part of the work that constantly needs to be done in order to stay on top of a 
fast paced financial landscape, especially within finance, a client from an insurance company could come to me with a request. And that means now I need to go learn everything about insurance premiums, interest rates, annuities, perpetuities. Now, admittedly, this particular example isn't as difficult for me because I have a degree and background in finance and actuarial science. But if I didn't have that degree or background knowledge, then the expectation is I have to know and understand everything about the industry and all the processes that happen within that industry. The need for constant learning has just increased tenfold because of all the AI tools we've just mentioned. You have to stay on top of not only the developments within the tools themselves, but also on top of any regulations or policies that are being developed that'll affect the way we use those tools and the way we work. So if you aren't a self learner and you don't like the idea of constantly computing vast amounts of data and information in your brain on a daily basis, then perhaps this isn't the career you ought to pursue. Reason number three is that if you aren't a good communicator or you don't like the idea of doing a job in which communication is a central aspect of the role, then this probably isn't the best job for you. I personally don't mind the amount of communication I have to do. I'm literally talking to a camera right now. I've made an entire video about why communication is one of the most important skills for data analysts and I'll link that video up here, but I'll, I'll summarize that video for you now. People tend to think that data analysts don't have to communicate or present things to too many people. That's not the case. In fact, communication is required at every step of any project you're working on. When a client comes to you with a request, there's a communication there where you'll have to clarify what exactly they're looking for. You'll have to ask them in-depth questions to get to the bottom of their request. On longer projects, there'll often be a follow-up meeting where you'll let them know if there are any points that have come up that need further clarification and then give them an update on how the work is going. There may be data points that you're unable to collect and you've decided to forego, so you have to explain that to them as well. And finally, when a project is complete, you can't just send the file to them and say, well, that's all over with, that's great. More often than not, you'll likely be giving them a presentation, detailing your process, your findings, your analysis, your analysis, which includes any points of interest and any identified outliers and possibly next steps that they should take based on their goal. And that's not where it ends too. They could come back two weeks later and say, hmm, I'm not sure what this means. Could you clarify this further? So you'll have to explain that point and help them understand what the data is showing. You could have written the most incredible query or conducted an exceptional piece of analysis but that doesn't help anyone if you can't explain it to someone who doesn't understand or doesn't have the relevant level of expertise. There's always a constant line of communication open between you and your colleagues, you and your manager and most importantly between you and your clients and that line needs to be maintained if you want to progress and be good at your role. I also have to present to stakeholders and upper management in my role. Let's say we worked out that the team needs access to a new database. It could be anything but let's say we need a new database that costs £20,000 per annum per user. So I'll have to create a business case I'll present to upper management explaining the cost analysis that's been conducted and persuade them and get them to approve that expense. So dependent on your role, you'll be giving a lot of presentations and you'll have to persuade and communicate with a lot of different people. Now this goes without saying, but reason number four is that this probably isn't the career to pursue if you don't like maths. Because trust me, there's a lot of maths. You're working with data, which 90% of the time is quantitative rather than qualitative. And more often than not, you're extracting incredibly granular information so you need to have strong mathematical skills. There are a lot of numbers you need to remember and be able to perform quick calculations on the fly. There's not only numbers like revenue and profit, there's also numbers like unique company identifiers, risk indicators, dates, article numbers. There's an entire world of quantitative information that you'll need to get accustomed to and be comfortable working with. Coding is also mathematics. Writing a SQL query or automating something with Python is also a branch of mathematics. There's VBA and Excel and some roles require the use of R or MATLAB. There's a lot of coding that comes with being a data analyst. If maths is something that doesn't come naturally to you or you don't like the idea of working with numbers all day, then that'll probably translate into your work and prevent you from producing good analysis. You'll also be working with a lot of incomplete and bad data. So do bear that in mind. That might be a reason you don't want to become a data analyst. And last but not least, reason number five is that this probably isn't the career for you if you get easily frustrated or bored. There will be countless times that the data just doesn't want to work and you'll have to maintain a level head and deploy problem solving skills to find the issue. About two weeks into my role, I was working on a request where the data just wouldn't work. The data was from the web and after cleaning and validating the data, I was ultimately going to create a pivot table with specific filters in theory, very, very straightforward. In reality, not so much. The first time I created the table, I returned a total of 639 companies that fell within those filtered parameters. The second time it was 534. The third time it was 712. It's not as if the source data was changing. 
it wasn't updating, they weren't stock prices, the data was static. I was making mistakes somewhere, so I said, okay, I'm gonna write down a list of all the steps I need to take in order to get to the desired outcome. So I meticulously wrote down every single step. I followed that list to a T. I created the pivot table and I ended up with 672 companies. I remember this so vividly because at the time I did get a little frustrated because the project was due that afternoon and, and for the life of me I just couldn't figure out where I'd gone wrong. I went through each iteration of my steps and still couldn't find where the issue was. In the end I just scrapped the entire file and started from scratch. I've gotten much better at dealing with that frustration because believe me that isn't the only time that's happened but I've also had to develop specific problem solving skills to be able to identify the root cause of a problem because you can't just keep scrapping a project if something doesn't work and starting from scratch. If that sounds like something you wouldn't want to deal with on a daily basis, then that's reason number five, you probably shouldn't become a data analyst. Now I have to say a lot of the points we've covered in this video aren't intended to discourage anyone from becoming a data analyst. I don't have any inside information that data analysts in 2025 are gonna win the lottery and I'm trying to keep that from you. In fact, a lot of the points we covered in this video can easily be learnt and worked on. You can get better at learning and retaining information. You can learn to upskill and adapt to a changing work environment. You can work on and develop communication and mathematical skills. And with the passage of time, you'll undoubtedly get much, much better at dealing with any obstacles that might come up. This video was just to outline some of the realities of being a data analyst and let people make an informed decision on the career in the best way possible. Well, there you have it, the yin to the yang that was my previous video. Five reasons you shouldn't become a data analyst in 2023. If you haven't already checked out my other video on five reasons you should become a data analyst, I'll link it down below. I recommend giving it a watch to balance out some of the ideas we covered in this video. I hope this video is useful. Leave a like down below if it was and comment down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on where you think the profession is headed in the future. Subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys in the next one.